I am uh, a native Washingtonian and I studied uh, at the University of Virginia undergrad and master's in art history. And uh, it's interesting because my art history degree was not in African American art history, which was not actually offered at the time when I was at UVA, but I had grown up in a family very interested in history. Both of my parents were teachers. My grandfather was a professor of African American literature at Howard University, so I certainly had been exposed to a lot of great books, great thinkers, uh, people who would al always visit my grandfather, incredible writers and authors, so I always had a love for African American history. And then after graduate school, when I moved back in 91 to the D.C. area, I took uh, contract work jobs with the Smithsonian Institution and then also at Mount Vernon. And at, while at Mount Vernon serving as a, a tour guide, I met Gladys uh, Tansel, who was the first African American guide at, the, uh, at Mount Vernon. And then she was also on the board, a member of the Alexandria Society for the Preservation of Black Heritage, which was the friends group for the uh, Alexandria Black History Resource Center, as we were known then. And she recommended me when a job came open for a part-time curator. And that's how I, I was hired. Sure, when I arrived in 93, it, it was really one of the first stories I heard because, of course, you can't help but as you're walking down Alfred Street, if you're at the corner of Wythe and North Alfred, see the stone that Eugene Thompson had erected there for acknowledging the Robert Robinson Library and it being built in 1940. And then, so I, and I would say pretty much everyone, every African American of a certain age that I met was certainly aware of the sit-in and the legacy of the sit-in. There was a small exhibit here uh, with the sit-in picture that always hung in the, in the gallery. And then also, um, they had started having programs. I know the earliest documented one that I can find a program for, for this event, uh, was a tribute to Samuel Wilbur Tucker that was held in 1991 at the Resource Center. So I know that that was one of the first formal programs held there, but shortly after I came, we had a wonderful offer from the National Park Service to have um, a scholar, Caridad de la Vega, work on two lesson plans for us. One was on Freedom House uh, and looking at the domestic slave trade, and the other was on the 1939 sit-in. So we were very, very lucky to have that. And then over the years, we forged a great friendship with Stephen Ackerman, the late Stephen Ackerman, who wrote an incredible article about Samuel Wilbur Tucker for the Washington Post magazine that sort of put him locally more on the radar. But it was always really celebrated here within the community and always acknowledged as really one of our earliest uh, actions uh, by African Americans uh, for civil rights. I was fascinated by the story and always wanting to learn more. And one of the people I had the pleasure of knowing was the late Elsie uh, Tucker Thomas, who was um, Samuel Wilbur Tucker's sister. And she was alive at the time and was in and out of the museum, was a local historian, was very instrumental in us uh, opening our Watson reading room in 1995. So always hearing from her, and she was very instrumental in donating items that she had um, from her brother and then encouraging uh, his wife, Julia Tucker, uh, to donate uh, some artifacts to us, and which she did before um, Julia Tucker passed away and I believe it was 2000. So knowing those two, I knew Julia Tucker just very, very briefly, just to say hello to, but she would come up um, on occasion, especially when we dedicated, or the, the library dedicated a plaque in 2000 uh, for the 25th anniversary of the Human Rights Ordinance, and they dedicated a plaque to uh, the sit-in participants, and Julia Tucker was there, as was um, Oliver Hill, and it was shortly before both of their deaths.
unfortunately i never learned about it in school especially to me surprising considering that it was a local story but to be honest i didn't learn a lot about african american history during the years i was going to school so it was a pretty big deal if you had a class and a teacher who celebrated black history month and unfortunately the schools i went to really didn't focus that much on african american history so it really was a story i learned as an adult and by doing a deeper dive when i was hired here I mean, I think for me, it was looking at all of the information that we had on the sit-in, looking at newspaper articles from the period, looking at the material that Elsie uh, Tucker Thomas donated and that Julia Tucker also donated. So looking at those materials and then it just came through speaking with members of the community in different programs. I mean, we had a program on African American education and civil rights in uh, 1998 that was a big program more of like a forum that we did and then for the 60th anniversary we looked at the sit-in again and, uh, and we did this event looking at civil rights and desegregation uh, and all of the issues in Alexandria in honor of the 60th anniversary of the sit-in. In 2000 I believe it was 2006 I may be slightly off on the date it was when we opened an exhibit in here called Securing the Blessings of Liberty and when we opened that exhibit, we redid the panels in the lobby and we did a dedicated panel to the sit-in because we were thinking about what are the things we want visitors to know when they walk in the door. We wanted them to know a brief uh, history of the museum, how it got started, but the sit-in was the other core story and the Alexandria Society for the Preservation of Black Heritage. So those were three things we wanted people to learn about coming into the museum before they even looked at the galleries. In 2014, and that was when we opened our exhibit, uh, Sit Down and Take a Stand, that looked at the sit-in and the role of Tucker, and we showcased some of our artifacts that we have that belong to uh, Samuel Wilbert Tucker, that belong to the family, uh, and it was a panel exhibit that we had, and then we also had little buttons that said, sit down and take a stand, and so we worked, I was working on the research for that exhibit, looking at Tucker, looking at his influences. I had talked to Steve Ackerman. Uh, I had talked to, uh, we'd actually done research going, looking at Howard and uh, the professor, Howard Thurman at Howard, who was a big influence on Samuel Wilbert Tucker and was teaching him about peaceful uh, demonstrations because Thurman had traveled to India and had seen what Gandhi, I think, was doing at the time. So there were all these different influences. Um, talking to anyone who really had known any of the sit-in participants or what they remembered. And then a great, uh, a huge help, and this wasn't for the exhibit, but came later, but it came with the understanding more and really a deep dive was when um, Brenda, Dr. Brenda Mitchell Powell shared with me her, her dissertation and then her research and then that was leading up to her book, um, Public in Name Only, and so, which is a wonderful book, looking not only at the sit-in, but the Alexandria Library System, what's going on in the context of the time period, and I think it's just, it's an incredible read for everyone. Matt, uh, from my memory, lived not too far away and would often walk by the museum and notice the stone at the corner of, of North Alfred and Wyth and the fact that this building that we're sitting in now was built in 1940 as a result of the 1939 sit-in. And he kept walking by it and from talking with Matt, I remember him saying it just kind of inspired him and spurred him on that more people needed to know about this story and he had never made a documentary before as far as I know in his life and he wondered if he could do it and I remember him saying that he talked to his mother about this and it was just like just debating back and forth I mean am I the person to do this should somebody else be doing it doing this or telling the story and she was just very encouraging that if you don't step out of your comfort zone and try something new you might regret it so I think he took that advice to heart and 
uh, worked on the sit-in and got a great team of people together. He came to us with this idea and Lewis Hicks was the director at the time and I was the assistant director slash curator and we were behind it and we thought it would be great if he could uh, create this documentary. It's something that could premiere for the 250th of the city of Alexandria. And so uh, Black History Resource Center funded uh, part of the documentary. The Office of Historic Alexandria funded part of the documentary. And then also the uh, committee for the 250th celebration of the city of Alexandria uh, funded uh, part of the documentary. In 1940, uh, the city opened the Robert H. Robinson Library, which was a segregated facility for uh, African Americans. And being in this space, you can see that it's actually not a very big space. So you imagine it with bookcases around the wall, an area for the librarian to sit, tables uh, and benches and chairs. Uh, and I think there's even a little janitor's closet. It was not a very big uh, space. I think really probably about 700 square feet of space for the community, but the community, um, while they wanted full integration, don't make no mistake, they really did embrace the space, the Robert Robinson Library, because it was their community library. They had very dedicated library staff. They uh, were very uh, interested readers. Uh, they were always requesting more books and different books for the collection. There were um, also programs, storytelling, art programs, art exhibits that happened here. So it became part of the community. And then after the years when it was a library and then uh, it became for a short period of time uh, a bookmobile station that, that they, it was like a depot as they prepared for the bookmobile. Eventually, after the fight to save the old Alfred Street Baptist Church, uh, the group that worked to fight to preserve that 19th century part of Alfred Street Baptist Church looked around and realized that there was no center for black history in Alexandria. So that was when the Alexandria Society for the Preservation of Black Heritage was formed and it was their goal to create a museum. It's just these four walls. The original windows are still uh, in, in this room. So the original footprint and the door is to the left of me. Uh, and what's really interesting is that in, to the left of me off camera is a case that has a miniature of the reading room uh, that was done by our uh, great volunteers, uh, Sharon Frazier and Linwood Smith, who are incredible dollhouse makers. And we've had th three shows over the years of their dollhouses. And they're dollhouses look at African-American buildings in Alexandria that no longer exist and they remember using uh, the reading room and what I love about the miniature there they created is that you see some magazines in the front of the miniature and they're actually magazines from our collection that they miniaturized that are there and so it's based on their memory uh, and then when we so when you talk about educating people about the sit-in they've educated people over the years uh, about the sit-in through this dollhouse and through the multiple shows. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, the library, I mean, Rose has always talked about that uh, we had always celebrated the sit-in and talked about it, but they weren't doing it as much at the library, and she's made an effort to make sure that story is told through exhibition, an exhibition that they've created through, I remember I think for the 75th, there was an outdoor uh, festival or anniversary celebration where there were speakers and uh, a lot of city organizations had tables and we were all sharing what we knew about the sit-in and also encouraging people to get involved and then her staff worked on the uh, state historic marker that you'll find on Washington Street about the sit-in. So it's been a great collaborative effort over the years working with the library, seeing how they've expanded the story, uh, continuing to talk about the story here 
ourselves at the museum and I think with Brenda's book it really is just the icing on the cake that we have a way that we can tell the story in so many ways and get that story out to people all over the United States. I know Rose speaks about the sit-in at conferences and gives lectures as do I and I think that all of our work together will make sure that Tucker's story is not forgotten. I think it's, it's meant a great deal to the community because being a very early civil rights action, I mean, I think it's something that Alexandria as a whole can be very proud of, that you have these two uh, situations for civil rights where you have African Americans taking control and showing agency over, whether it's in 1864 or whether it's in 1939, over their lives and access to what they feel they need and that they should deserve as citizens, especially in 1939. I mean, these young men could not get library cards, but yet their parents are paying taxes to the city, but they don't have equal access to all city facilities. And so why couldn't they have full integration? All of the history that I work with just means a great deal because I often imagine the people who made that history seeing it now through the eyes that I get to see it through. And I often wonder, like, did they ever think that this would happen, that we would have full integration? I mean, and the fact that they had to have faith that we would have full integration, and they had to keep up that fight. And I think you see it very early on in Alexandria's history, even in the 19th century with our contraband story, with the contraband coming into Alexandria because we were a Union stronghold. And we have a phrase that we use in Alexandria that these contraband or escaped slaves came into Alexandria seeking freedom, but many did not live long in it. And you see story after story of the contraband who just wanted to be free, just wanted to have education, just wanted to have the possibility of freedom for their children. And that's all anybody wants. And you see these stories that we hear about in the 19th century that resonate resonate to me today and then when I walk into say our museum um, Freedom House Museum before we changed the exhibits there was a large image of uh, contraband uh, in the main hallway and I would always walk by that and look at the eyes of the men women and children in that picture and just wonder like, did they ever see or ever even imagine that there could be a place where that would tell their story or that there would be a museum director who's African American. Those things, I mean, you know, they're, they're just trying to survive. And I just feel so privileged that I get to tell their story and share their history and share it in a way that connects people um, with understanding about the core of basic civil rights and how it is so important um, to everyone in this country to have those rights, to have equity, and to have access to all facilities, to all things, to education so that you can really be all that you can be. We say that often enough, but if you don't have access and you don't have equity, it, you can't. You need to have a fair and equal playing ground so that you can be the best you can be. And I think that's important for everyone. I am glad that all of these stories are now being told and being told in a very public way and are becoming a core and a part of the fabric of the history of the city of Alexandria that's interpreted through every historic site and in all of the programming that we do. So I think these are great changes that have happened that we owe uh, to those who came in the past.